Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadee Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program and we come together on Wednesdays to encourage, support, and motivate each other in our meditation practice. So welcome, We're very pleased that you're here. If this is your first time, what we do each Wednesday is we rotate between breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation. And then on Sunday, what we do is we go through this book chapter by chapter, and I discuss each chapter in the book one by one. And this week, this Sunday, we're going to be in chapter 20, which is titled Animal to Human, The Evolution of Our Consciousness. So I'd like to welcome all of you, whether you're joining us for the first time or you've been joining regularly. In today's class, what we're going to be doing is a guided breathing mindfulness meditation where I'll guide you guys in meditation. And then after meditation, I will open up to any questions that you guys have related to any topics on the path to enlightenment that you might have, whether that's about meditation itself or the Eightfold Path or the Four Noble Truths, the Five Precepts, the Natural Law of Gamma, the Three Poisons, about something that's happening in your life and you need help with or something you've seen somewhere about Buddhist teachings or anything else. Really, any and all questions are open. And the way that you ask questions is you put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Our moderators will see that and be sure your question gets asked. And if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow-up questions directly. So I'd like to go ahead and invite all of you guys to join for meditation. And then after we do the meditation, we'll open up to any questions that you might have. So usually when you're learning meditation, you start in the seated position. And if you are on the floor, you might put a cushion under your rear and kind of cross your legs a bit. Not too tight because you're not interested in the circulation being inhibited. And if you're on a chair, you might just be sitting in a chair with your feet flat on the floor or maybe cross at the ankles. There's no one exact way to put your body because it's important to have the body be comfortable, not luxurious, not painful, but comfortable. So your lower body should be nice and comfortable, either sitting on the floor or sitting on a chair or something like that. Your hands and your arms, those can rest comfortably in your lap. The Buddha put his right hand on top of his left and his thumbs together, and then he put that into his lap. But if that's not comfortable for you, you can put your hands palm down on your thighs. You can put them palm down on your knees. You can put them palm up. If you're sitting in a chair, you might have them on the armrest of your chair. Essentially, your lower body and the hands and arms should be completely relaxed with no muscles engaged whatsoever. And then the upper body is a bit different though. With this, you would like the upper body to be erect, not slouched and not real rigid because what you're interested in is having the body be in the middle because if it's real slouched, the mind's gonna tend to be complacent or if it's real rigid, then the mind's gonna be kind of uptight and anxious. So you'd like your upper body to be erect and straight, but not real rigid and not slouched. Once you've got the body in position, Then just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just working to establish the breath, taking nice gradual breaths in through the nose and out through the nose. I'm going to start with some chanting and you're welcome to join along with the chants if you know these. And if not, you can just hang out here with the breath and I'll be back with some more guidance after the chance.
Establishing the breath. Your breath isn't going to necessarily match up with the guidance that I'm providing because this is your practice. I'm just here to remind you and guide you. But wherever you get to the next in breath, breathe in gradually through the nose, experiencing the full breath. And then whenever you get to the out breath, Breathe out gradually, out through the nose, experiencing the full exhale. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in. In, out. Once the breath is established, start fixating the mind on the sound of the breath or the sensation of air moving into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. In, out. Breathing in. In, out. With the mind fixated on the breath, 
Whenever you observe that the mind is off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. There's no need to judge the thought. There's no need to label it or analyze it. No need to observe the thought or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Just wherever you observe that the mind is off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. In, out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath. Anytime the mind is off the breath, cut it off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do right now. No one needs you. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in. In, out.
ಕವನ್ನಿವಾ ಸವಖಾತ ಮಸಿ ಸುಪಥಿ ಪೋ ಮಾಘವತ ಸಾಕಸಿ ನಪೋರ ಸಾಗವತ ಆರೋ ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಪುತ ಸಪೋರ ಸಾಗವತ ಆರೋ ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಪುತ ಸ ನಪೋರ ಸಾಗವತ ಹಾರೋ ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಪುತ ಸಿ ಪಿಸೋಮಾಕವ ಹಾರ ಸಮ್ಮ ಸ ಚಾರೋ ಸಖತೋ ಕಾನು ತೆರೋಪುರಿ ಸಾತಿ ಸಾತವ ಮನು ಸ್ನ Okay, if you guys would like to slowly make your way out of meditation. As you guys make your way out of meditation, I'll just uh, give you a little reminder about something. When you're doing breathing mindfulness meditation, it's important to remember that you're not trying to actually eliminate the thoughts. This is impossible as long as you're alive. You want to eliminate thoughts, but you can quiet the mind. You can still the mind and get these longer and longer periods of quietness or peacefulness, calmness in the mind. But eventually there's going to be a thought during your meditation and this is completely normal. So what you're doing in meditation is you're gaining control or discipline over the mind that when the mind runs away off the breath, you can pull it back and you've got the discipline and the control to do that of course you're building mindfulness or awareness of mind you're building concentration or singleness of mind and you're eliminating craving desire attachment but you're also gaining this control or this discipline because the untrained mind lacks discipline it lacks the ability to sit and just be calm and be peaceful So the unenlightened mind is like a wild animal that it wants to run over here and run over there and run over here and when it does you're pulling it back and saying no nope, sit right here and then it sits there for a little while and then it pulls in another direction and then you pull it back you're like no nope, sit right here and over time the mind eventually gets to the point where it gives in it essentially submits to you and it realizes that it needs to sit right here and you get these longer and longer and longer periods of peacefulness or quietness so that's what you're going for but even when the mind is enlightened you're going to have an occasional thought even if you're in meditation and the mind's quiet and it's peaceful and it's calm and you're thinking wow the mind is so calm it's so peaceful that's a thought So you're going to have thoughts in meditation but if you can be aware when they happen that's mindfulness and if you can bring the mind back this is gaining the control so that you can have this concentration and this discipline of the mind that's what you're really working towards in this meditation not to actually eliminate the thoughts so I just thought I would remind you guys of that and then just 
open up to any questions that you guys might have about anything that you would like to discuss related to any topics on the path to enlightenment. So you can put your questions into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Yes, sir. Kind of to stem off of that question. So then, if we notice that during a meditation session, there were a few thoughts that I guess would that not be, let me rephrase that. It seems like that then wouldn't be a reason to really be frustrated or feel like the meditation session was to say bad or unproductive because you're at least aware that there are thoughts in the mind during that meditation session, which is helping to cultivate further mindfulness. Is that a good way to look at that, sir? Exactly. If you're in meditation and your mind is bombarded with thoughts and you know that, and this is typical when someone first starts, that's a really good thing. That means you have mindfulness, you have awareness of mind. Don't judge it as a good or a bad meditation or you know something like that because if you're judging your meditation sessions, then you're going to have these pleasant feelings and these painful feelings because you're judging the meditation session. Instead, you just do it and then whatever it is, it is. At the end of the meditation, you just, you're done with it. And if your mind was bombarded with thoughts and you know that, that's mindfulness or awareness of mind outstanding. Of course, over time, those thoughts will quiet but at least you've got mindfulness and awareness of mind, and that's a really good thing. And then as you do get longer and longer periods of peacefulness and quietness, and then if later on the thoughts come again and they're really bombarded, you know, you maybe go like two weeks or three weeks with pretty quiet mind and pretty still mind, and then all of a sudden, whoa, whoa, you know, these thoughts start coming back again. If you judge the meditation and think of like, oh, that was a bad meditation because I had so many thoughts, this is going to kind of degrade your mind thinking that it was no good. And you might even give up if if you think of it that way. So if you just think of it as, okay, I'm just going to do the meditation. I'm cultivating awareness of mind. I'm developing concentration. I'm eliminating craving. I'm gaining this control. Whatever happens, happens. I don't have any expectation that the mind should be peaceful and quiet. I'm just going to do the meditation and cultivate these qualities. And then these qualities of mind are going to help me in daily life. And what you understand is that as you progress, your mind will become more and more quieted. But don't have an expectation that that's going to happen or when it's going to happen or how it should happen. Just know that that's what you're ultimately going to be working towards. But just don't judge your meditation or evaluate it or you have expectations about it, just do it, cultivate whatever qualities you're cultivating, mindfulness and concentration, getting this discipline of the mind, and then eliminating craving, and then just be done with it. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. I see that Tony has his hand raised. Let's go to him for his question, sir. Thank you, Miranda. Yes, Teacher David, uh, today, for whatever the reason, I'm, uh, my mind's jumping all over and, and I'm having pain in my shoulder and, and I didn't really have a, in fact, I had a very, very uh, discontented uh, meditation center. Uh, what would you recommend doing in this case? Should I not meditate and, and uh, come back another time? Or what would, you, what would your, your teachings be on that, sir? Thank you. Yeah, just stick with it. Keep doing two or three sessions a day for 30 minutes or more and just continue to do that. If your mind is really busy, what I would suggest to continue your meditation is do walking meditation. And I know this is something you haven't learned with me in person, but there's the video that you can learn from. And if you do end up coming here to Thailand, I'll surely show this to you and teach it to you and help you get good at it. Because walking meditation is really good for an overactive mind. There were times in the past where I would sit down to meditate and within five minutes, my mind was just bombarded with thoughts and I would just get up and go do walking meditation and whoa, would it slow it down like amazingly. And then sometimes I would sit back down and continue to do seated meditation again, or sometimes I would just stick with walking meditation. And then sometimes I would be getting ready to do meditation, realize the mind was overactive and having anxiety, and I would just go right to walking and I would just do walking only and that's it. So stick with the meditation, continue with it, but 
be sure that you learn walking meditation because that's really good for overactive mind. Um, on YouTube, Papiko asks, how many types of meditation are there in Buddhism? So the Buddha taught essentially four different meditations, but two primary forms. Nowadays, there's hundreds and maybe thousands of meditations that people have come up with, but those aren't the teachings of a Buddha. A Buddha is the discoverer, the originator, the declarer of the path to enlightenment. So it's a Buddha's teachings that are going to lead to enlightenment. Anything that's been changed after a Buddha this is just making it more difficult for people to be able to understand the path and get the results of the path. So while you'll see you know, countless meditations that are available out there, the two primary forms that you should develop in your practice is breathing mindfulness meditation. This is the primary form that the Buddha used and talks about it very highly as one of the things that kind of propelled him to enlightenment in addition to all the other teachings and loving kindness meditation. These are the two meditations that are addressing two of the three primary problems in the mind. The high level problems are craving, anger, and ignorance, or the unknowing of true reality. Breathing mindfulness meditation is addressing craving with generosity as well. And then loving kindness meditation is addressing anger along with developing and practicing loving kindness in daily life. And then what's addressing the ignorance is that you don't believe the teachings. You learn, you reflect, and you practice working to independently verify whether they're true or not. And this is how you cultivate wisdom. So the only two that everybody really needs is breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation because they address two of the primary problems that are in the unenlightened mind. And then there's two other meditations that you can learn and practice on a specialized as needed basis. There's one for eliminating sexual cravings. So if somebody has really high sexual cravings, they can use that one to diminish their sexual cravings and ultimately eliminate them if they like. And then there's one that I share which is helpful to develop the perception of non-self, develop the perception of impermanence. The Buddha taught this as part of his teachings that you need to kind of soak in the perception of impermanence into the mind related to non-self in eliminating the conceit I am. This is the arrogance and the pride and this personal existence view. So I teach this meditation to realize non-self, but there's a lot of other work that you need to do before that meditation can really be beneficial for you. So when you're starting out to learn with the words of the Buddha, even if you've been practicing Buddhism for 10, 20, you know, 30 years, if you haven't been doing breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation in the way that I share, it's important to build those two up so that they're addressing two of the major problems in the mind. And then these other two you use on an as-needed basis once you've already got a well-established breathing mindfulness meditation and a loving-kindness meditation practice. Thank you, sir. I see that Max has his hand raised. Let's go to him for his question, sir. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Teacher David. Uh, so during breathing mindfulness meditation, the mind is kind of all over the place um, and I have noticed that if I kind of control my breath and take these big long uh, exaggerated breath, deep breaths that uh, I have a better luck maintaining focus and maintaining my uh, meditation is that okay or do I just is having a more natural breath advice yeah so this is another thing you can do in addition to walking meditation like i suggested to tony is you can slow down the breath when i talk about a natural breath it is a natural breath the natural breath is nice and slow it's nice and gradual so if you slow the breath down to what i describe as a natural breath or a gradual breath this will slow the mind down as well. Sometimes the mind's just too busy and you just got to get up and go do walking meditation, but you can work with it and kind of coax it into slowing down if you work with the breath because the mind is fixated on the breath. So if you slow the breath down, 
you can s- typically slow the mind down. But sometimes, like I said, it's just too busy. You got to get up and go do walking meditation. So I used my hand in the past to show people the speed at which I breathe. And it's actually not very quick at all. It's actually quite slow. It's about a 15 or 20 second inhale and a 15 or 20 second exhale. That's what I ultimately got to. When I first started meditating, it was fairly shallow, you know, three to five seconds. But as you slow the breath down and breathe more naturally, what I describe as naturally or gradually, it's about a 15 or 20 second inhale and exhale. And I think I've even timed it as long as 30 seconds sometimes. So I've done that before with the hand. I don't know if you guys would like me to do that or not. I can do that if you'd like to kind of show you my inhale and my exhale. I think that would be helpful, sir. Okay. So what I'll do is this will be the exhale, opening up my hand, and then this will be the inhale, breathing in. I'll collapse my hand so you can see uh, the breath, okay? So here we'll start with the with the inhale. So with that, at the top of the breath and at the bottom on the exhale, there's a little bit of a gap where nothing's happening. There's no inhale, no exhale. So in addition to the breathing, when you saw me kind of go back like this with the hand and just kind of hold it, that's kind of the gap at the top of the inhale. And then when I expand out like this and breathe out, there's also a gap at the bottom of the exhale where there's nothing happening. So just like a kind of a two or three second of nothing happening, just stillness. And I call this the gap, you know, the gap between the inhale and the exhale. So I don't know how long that was, but when I've done this before and then I go back and time it, it's been about 15 or 20 seconds. And your breath doesn't have to be exactly what my breath is because everybody's a bit different. And it took me time to work to that where I could slow the breath down to that degree and feel just fine. There were times where I felt like I wasn't getting enough air, especially when there was the gap and I wasn't used to that gap. I was used to more of a shallow breath. I thought I was going to die and I had this fear of death. So I had to get comfortable with that gap and that was actually helpful to eliminate the fear of death is to observe that gap and realize that the body doesn't have to be breathing continuously and it can experience that gap and be just fine so i would say work with your breath slow it down it sounds like that's what max is doing and and it's helping it's working for him and others you can use this too if you have a real shallow breath you know that's okay that's where you're at now Just focus on the breath and then just gradually slow it down. One of the things the Buddha shares when he talks about meditation is he says, if you're breathing short, know that you're breathing short. If you're breathing long, know that you're breathing long. Essentially, focus the mind on the breath. But what you'll notice is if you do have an overactive mind, since the mind is focused on the breath, if you slow the breath down, it'll slow the mind down. Um, Yes, and then on YouTube, Pepico asks, what about... Vipassana meditation, is it taught in Buddhism? There's places that teach Vipassana meditation, but this term Vipassana, I don't use that term because I've never studied any Vipassana retreats or anything like that. From what I hear from students who study Vipassana, they share with me that what I teach is breathing mindfulness meditation. This is what they teach the first three days of a Vipassana retreat. And then they do this body scanning where they kind of develop the awareness of the bodily sensations and feelings and things like this. But I don't really know much about it because I've never studied it. 
I've never seen the word Vipassana in the Pali Canon, but the qualities of mind that it sounds like they're developing in Vipassana meditation, I've seen that the Buddha talks about those. So it really depends who you talk to because the word Vipassana means different things to different people. But these are the the types of meditations that I share. The breathing mindfulness meditation, the Buddha references that. The loving kindness meditation, developing the unattractiveness of the body, and developing the perception of impermanence to eradicate the conceit I am. These are the four types of meditations that you'll see him reference in his teachings. And then he talks about developing the four foundations of mindfulness. And that's something that's important to do. And I think that's what they're doing in Vipassana, but I just don't know for myself. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, I think this is more of a follow-up from Papiko's first question about the types of meditation that there are in Buddhism. But they ask, do we have to learn them in a sequence or can we start from any one of them? I suggest that students start with breathing mindfulness meditation and build this practice up first because this is the foundation. And I would say do that for a minimum of four weeks and upwards of six to eight weeks and really develop that practice really well so that you're consistently meditating two or three times a day and you're building it up closer and closer to 30 minutes. And then next you would bring in the loving kindness meditation. That would be the next one to bring in. That would be the order that I would suggest that somebody learn them in. And then now we're maybe three months, six months into it, and someone's been learning breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness, and they're practicing it. And now they're kind of got the Eightfold Path and all the other teachings like the Three Universal Truths, the Four Noble Truths, the Five Precepts, things like this are starting to come underway. And maybe, depending on some condition of someone's mind, maybe in six months or a year, they might even start experiencing the jhanas. It's not unlikely for that to occur. But if that starts to occur, then it's time to start focusing on the Ten Fetters. And that's where you might need the meditation for eliminating sexual cravings. Or you might even need that earlier on because if you're trying to practice the five precepts, if somebody has multiple sexual partners and they're trying to bring that down to one in order to practice the five precepts, they might need that particular meditation sooner, maybe like in the three to six month mark. But everybody's different. So I kind of share these times just to kind of give you kind of a, a frame of reference. But everybody's different. But I would definitely suggest focusing on the breathing mindfulness meditation first and then the loving kindness meditation, and then the others come afterwards on an as-needed basis. Yes, thank you, sir. And then on Zoom, Bunya asks, is the breathing mindfulness meditation also Vipassana meditation? I think you may have already answered that. Yeah, since I've never taken a Vipassana meditation retreat, I don't know what people are teaching as part of Vipassana. I hear it from people, like different people tell me different things, because obviously with the universal truth of impermanence, one student will tell me one thing, another person will tell me something else. And as they go out in the world and practice at Vipassana retreats, they have different experiences. So for me to say what I teach is Vipassana, I can't say that because I haven't seen the truth for myself of what is Vipassana based on one definition because there's not one definition because of the universal truth of impermanence. Multiple people think of Vipassana in many different ways. So rather than try to fit what I'm doing into a definition of what other people are are thinking because different people think of Vipassana in different ways. I just share, you know, what I teach is breathing mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation, elimination of sexual cravings and elimination of non-self. And then if I talk with somebody privately and they say, is what you teach uh, Vipassana? And I'll say, well, what do you think of when you think of the word Vipassana? And then they explain it to me and I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I teach. And then somebody else says, do you teach Vipassana? And I say, well, what do you think of Vipassana? And then they describe it. And I'm like, oh, that's not actually what I teach. So each person's definition is a bit different. So rather than try to say a statement that, yes, I teach Vipassana, there might be somebody that says, no, you don't, because 
I learned Vipassana this way. And then somebody else says, oh, yeah, you do. You do teach Vipassana because you're doing this, what I learned. So I don't use the word Vipassana because I haven't seen it in the Pali Canon, because people have different meanings and different definition of what that is. And I've never taken a Vipassana retreat, so I can't speak from my own experience and direct experience. But this breathing mindfulness meditation, I started calling what I do breathing mindfulness meditation. And then probably about four months, six months after, I started reading the Pali Canon and I saw that the Buddha calls it mindfulness of breathing. So I was like, oh, that's the same thing. That's what I call breathing mindfulness meditation. So it matched. So I share what I know that worked for me and what I see the Buddha talking about as well in the Pali Canon. And that's the only thing I can really speak to. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. Um, then also, I had a question not direct, not really related to meditation. Um, when working on right speech, we have the five factors of well-spoken speech that one can look at and use kind of as a guideline to make sure that we're practicing right speech. Is there anything similar to this with something like right intention? Um, I know that in the description for right intention, it's the intention of renunciation, the intention of harmlessness, but is there any sort of like a guideline to be sure that our intentions are within right intention, sir? Yeah, I just did a mini lesson on this yesterday. It's going to be published tomorrow, tomorrow morning, my time. And um, you'll see it come out where right intention has three aspects to it. It has the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, and the intention of harmlessness. Renunciation is the willingness to let go and give up false beliefs and misperceptions as well as letting go of unwholesome conduct. Because as long as one holds on to unwholesome conduct, then they're not going to be able to build right speech, right action, and right livelihood. So the mind needs to be willing to practice the intention of renunciation, where it has a willingness to let go and have renunciation. And not only let go of unwholesome conduct, but let go of false beliefs and misperceptions. Because if the mind is experiencing discontentedness, that means there's certain things in the mind that it doesn't understand. It has certain false beliefs and certain misperceptions. It still has that ignorance or the unknowing of true reality, or else it wouldn't still experience discontentedness. Going back to dependent origination, if ignorance has been fully transformed, then the whole chain of dependent origination has been dissembled and there's no discontentedness. So as long as there's discontentedness in the mind, then there is some ignorance or unknowing of true reality or false beliefs or misperceptions. So practicing the intention of renunciation where you're willing to let go, that's the first part. The second part is non-ill will, which non-ill will is the same as goodwill because non-ill will, it's a double negative, so it's a positive. It's goodwill or loving kindness, this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well and be peaceful. And then the third aspect of right intention is to practice harmlessness, being incapable or uninterested in harming other beings. Because as long as there's the interest to be harmful, then any harm that you put out, it's only going to come back to you. So if there's the intention to be harmful, then your speech, your actions, and your livelihood is going to be harmful too, because you're interested in being harmful. So practicing harmlessness, where you're uninterested or incapable of causing harm to others. This is the intention of harmlessness. So if you were practicing wrong intention, you'd be holding on to things, your beliefs, your opinions, your misperceptions. You wouldn't have an open mind. You wouldn't be interested in learning other things. You would be having ill will where you have hatred and anger and frustration and annoyance and dislike of other beings and you would be practicing harmfulness where you have this interest to harm other beings through your speech or your actions or other things. That would be wrong intention, holding on, 
having ill will and being interested to harm. But if you're practicing right intention, then you have an open mind. You're willing to learn and understand. You have this interest to let go of the unwholesome things in your life. You have this interest to let go of any false beliefs or misperceptions that are in the mind. And you're interested in practicing loving kindness or this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. And you have this interest of being harmless to others. So the right intention isn't that you're able to do it, right? Because you're still working on your speech, your actions, and your livelihood. But the intention is that you have the thinking or the thought of letting go of practicing loving kindness and practicing harmlessness. And if you have the thinking or the thought regularly on an ongoing, consistent basis, then you purified your intentions. So even if you go like three seconds when somebody cuts you off in traffic or a half a second, someone cuts you off in traffic, you're like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. You still haven't purified your intentions yet. You're still a bit of wrong intention there where the mind isn't practicing renunciation, non-ill will, and harmlessness. So you would like to get to the point where there's absolutely no wrong intention whatsoever, and your intentions have been fully purified. Your thinking or your thoughts have been fully purified. Okay. All right. And then I'm seeing there too, sir, where that would be right effort going into right intention, where you have that split second where the mind does have wrong intention, but you put the right effort towards that to cut that off and let that go. Exactly. And if you're practicing mindfulness, awareness of mind, then you catch that ill will or that harmfulness coming up in the mind. You spot it with the mindfulness. Then you apply right effort, which is cutting it off and letting it go. And that's what's going to ultimately purify your intentions. So that's why this eightfold path, it's not master one step before you go to the next it's learn all eight and then dial it in closer and closer and closer and closer and know that you're not going to be doing it perfectly. Even you might intellectually know it and you can understand what it is intellectually. You have to dial it in closer and closer and closer. And this is the accumulation of benefits. So when you're out in the world and you see that you're not practicing right intention, well, at least you know that, right? If you have studied the teachings well enough, and you've cultivated enough mindfulness that at least when you see that the mind doesn't have right intention, then at least you know it and you can take action. Where when you're off the path and you're oblivious to all these teachings and this ill will comes up, you're just like, you almost think this person deserves it, right? Like, you know, like they did something to hinder you from accomplishing your craving, which you didn't understand at the time, but you almost feel like they deserve this ill will that's being vented at them. Where when you start to understand right view and you're causing that anger and that frustration yourself and you understand right intention and you understand and practicing mindfulness and right effort, all of this is working together to purify the mind more and more. And a person needs to go through enough experiences where they're accumulating enough of these benefits. They're applying this path and they're applying this practice more and more and more in multiple situations. This is why initially when you first start on the path, it's really challenging. You know, it's a real struggle. It's really difficult. But you get over that struggle and you kind of, you know, overcome a lot of the challenges that you're experiencing. And then certain parts of the path get easier, but then certain parts get more difficult. But at least you're more prepared for it and you have more wisdom and you have a teacher, you have resources, you have a community, you have support. And gradually you accumulate more and more of these benefits of applying the path more and more in your daily life. And it eventually gets effortless. But all of these steps, all of the Eightfold Path, they're all working together, working towards the same goal. And you can think of them as tools as you learn these tools of how the mind should function. When you see that it's not functioning that way, then you have the tools to remedy it or solve it. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. And where you don't feel like you have those tools, that's where you reach out for help to get help. Absolutely. Understood. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, does not appear that we have any more questions at this time, sir. 
All right. Well, thank you all for joining for today to encourage, support, and motivate each other in your meditation practice. It's always nice to come together and meditate with you guys. If you're ever here in Thailand or anywhere else that I'm traveling to, come meditate in person. We can spend time together as a community. It's really lovely to be able to do that. This uh, Sunday, we're going to be in Chapter 20 of the Group Learning Program in this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment, Volume 1. This chapter is titled Animal to Human, The Evolution of Our Consciousness. This is where I'll help you to understand how the unenlightened mind functions very much like an animal. And what you're doing is you're purifying the mind on the Eightfold Path is you're becoming more and more human. You're functioning more and more like a human being, shedding these animal instincts. So the more you understand these animal instincts, the easier it is for you to identify them and shed them and eliminate them so that you can make wiser decisions to train the mind to become more and more human. This is also where we talk about the cycle of rebirth as well. So if you're interested in talking about that, we can be discussing that as part of that class as well, which is oftentimes something that we discuss. And then next Wednesday, we're going to be doing loving kindness meditation together on Wednesday. So you're welcome to join for that. And then, of course, on Saturday, we do the Pali Canon and English study group. You're always welcome to join for that. So I'll see you perhaps in one of these future classes or one of the retreats in the U.S. that are coming up next year or somewhere else along the lines, maybe just in a restaurant somewhere here in Chiang Mai or somewhere else. So have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.